Hi, Misha here. And this is my first attempt at a real video with the new camera. But things are already not going to plan. For one, my main light up here burned out today for no reason. So I'm going to have to basically break a six month long refusal to go into any businesses tomorrow to pick up new bulbs and other things. I've been a few places where all this has been going down, but things like doctor's offices and whatnot. So, oh well, made it over six months. I gotta admit, it wasn't bad. It's kind of nice. Well, I wanted to do a video on the Japanese Navy's second aircraft carrier ever and first fleet carrier. Now, we've talked about the Akagi before when I did a video with these two this is her not sister ship but companionship Kaga and we used this model before from De Agostini now Kaga here is from Eagle Moss she's a 1 1100 scale die cast and Akagi up here is a nice one it's from De Agostini and it's 1 1250 scale die cast But I thought it would be neat to have an Eagle Moss to see how they would do the Akagi. And this was actually, I think, the second issue in their series. And they're kind of hard to get. And I ordered one back in June. And I waited patiently. See, I can't be patient. And it got lost in the mail. To the seller's credit, he not only got me a replacement out, I notified him last Friday, and he's in China, of the issue. Not only did he get me a replacement, he sent it Express DHL, which got here in under a week. And he had to have it specially sent from Japan. So that was great. But, as you see... It's not exactly an Eagle Moss. And so I ended up being introduced today to a new product line. This is still one 1100 scale die cast. In fact, it's still the same factory that produced for Eagle Moss. This brand is known as KB. And this series is famous Japanese Navy ships. And the packaging comes complete with chrysanthemum, <laughs> which is kind of neat. The model is uh, the same scale. I mean, this is the Eagle Moss model, the same molds and everything. But as you see, it comes on a much larger base. It actually screws in just like the Eagle Moss. So you could put it on an Eagle Moss stand if you so chose. But this little plinth is neat. It goes to the very end, so you're not going to knock the edges. It also has more information than the Eagle Moss, including the scale. It's the same year, 1942. It does come with aircraft on the deck. And as you saw, it even comes with a lid. A kind of a plexiglass top. Which I really like. The only downside is now I kind of wish all my models had this big base and plexiglass top because that would make them virtually cat proof. And wouldn't that be a wonderful world? Now, it did not come with a magazine like the Eagle Moss, but since my wife doesn't read Japanese and since they're not brailled, the magazines, while neat, aren't really of a lot of personal interest. In other words, while I was a little surprised and didn't quite understand what I was opening today, I'm not at all unhappy, and I'd like to learn more about this brand, KB.
I did confirm that it's the same Chinese factory producing these that did them from Eagle, Eagle Moss. And it seems like Eagle Moss is done with their worships of the world collection and have been for a while. They did actually 82 issues, although the, the numbers are actually 1 through 80. There's 1A, 1B, 1C, and then they go to 2, which was Akagi. And as far as I've seen so far, and I could be very wrong on this, the KB are picking back up. They have done Yamato, which I will also show you, because I was happy enough with this that I just immediately ordered Yamato. They also have Nagato, which I would have ordered, but I have an Eagle Moss Nagato now. And now they have Akagi, which would have been the early issues as well, so it seems like they might be reissuing the Eagle Moss. Now the thing is, are they going to do all of them, the destroyers, the submarines, or just the big ships? And if they do all of them, would they put them on these big plinths with these big covers? Or is this just something they maybe do for the big carriers and battleships, and maybe they'll do the um, the bases, more the Eagle Moss style for the smaller ships? I don't know, but I'm interested to see. So, yeah, I thought we would compare this, the... Eagle Moss slash KB with the De Agostini. And go over the history of Akagi again. Why not? And also we're giving this new camera a spin a little earlier than I had originally anticipated. But that's because of the burned out light. And I figured this one had better light reception. I know Jay's very enamored with the video quality. So we'll see how it does. But... With that, yeah, let's talk about the Akagi, formerly of the Amagi class. And I guess you could say it really is Akagi class. Oh, one thing I'm feeling here, it's kind of neat. The stand has little holes already drilled, so theoretically you could swap stands between the models if you needed to, if one broke or something. Yeah, I really do like it so far. Heavy, too, but you'd expect. <clears throat> this ship was laid down in December of 1920 as a battle cruiser as part of Japan's new 8-8 plan. Eight ships, eight cruisers. To try to update after World War II. Oh, excuse me, World War I. However, in 1923, following the Washington Naval Treaty, it was reclassified as an experimental aircraft carrier. There were four Amagis cruisers, battle cruisers, as I should say, laid down. Amagi herself and Akagi were selected to be turned into carriers, and the two other ships that were less far along were just scrapped. Unfortunately, Amagi was destroyed during the Great Kanto Earthquake, which is actually where we ended up with Kaga, which was a Tosho battleship originally. So she was reclassified. She was launched in 1925 and finally commissioned into service in 1927. This is a big ship. It is over 855 feet long. It has a width, a beam of nearly... 103 feet. It weighs 36 and a half thousand tons. Standard, so light. And over 41,000 tons at full load. And since it was originally laid down as a battle cruiser, it had a speed of up to 31 and a half knots. Not bad for a carrier of its day, although later carriers like Suryu and Hiryu would even best that. And she was designed to carry roughly 66 operational aircraft with up to 25 aircraft disassembled in reserve as basically spare parts. And her configuration would change quite a bit 
over her service with a major refit in the late 30s. Originally, she would actually look very similar to Kaga here with these three flight decks. Two were for taking off, the two short ones, and the top one was for landing. This is uh, Kaga circa, I think it was 1933. I forget this model, but this is the, the original configuration. And notice it actually has guns, naval guns. And uh, a Kagi too would have guns in the beginning because at that time, designers really just weren't sure and military planners really just weren't sure about these new fangled carriers. And it would go from that to essentially leading the attack at Pearl Harbor and Midway and then being sunk at Midway. So it was in World War II only about half a year, but of course it had a long service during the 1930s. So with that, let's rewind back to the waning days of World War I. Well, at the end of World War I, Japan, the Navy, really wanted to uh, update its forces, having a total of eight modern battle cruisers and eight modern battle ships. With the difference basically being battle cruiser, faster battleship, better arm, armor, sorry. The uh, Tosos would be the new battleships. And the Amagis, they laid down four of them. They planned for four and laid them down. Would be the new battle cruisers. And Akaga, Akagi, excuse me, was the second one laid down. Which occurred in December of 1920, as I said. But then, 1921, 1922, we have the Washington Naval Treaty, which had all kinds of limitations. And Japan was not best pleased with how that treaty ended up treating them. They ended up having to scrap most of these. They barely were able to keep Nagato and Mutsu, Mutsu especially, but they managed it. But they were allowed to convert two into aircraft carriers for experimental training developmental purposes, just as the U.S. would do with the Lexington and Saratoga. Britain would not. So, Akagi here, along with her sister, um, Amagi, sorry, would uh, be earmarked, and both would start conversion. But then the Kanto earthquake happened, and Amagi was too heavily damaged to be worth converting. And the other two ships that had been laid down... I might have found a new way to set this on. It's distracting me. <laughs> Things unlearned. Anyway, the two other ships that were already scrapped, so what they would end up doing was getting a, a variation a dispensation to do the Tosa Kaga. That meant that they were converted pretty roughly the same with this triple-decker arrangement, but they would uh, be a little different. Kaga here would be a little heavier, a couple of thousand tons heavier. She would be shorter at just over 812 feet, but she would be wider at over 106 feet. But she would be slower as well. It's worth pointing out that Akagi was originally planned to have a top speed of about 28 and a half knots, but because she was lighter as a carrier versus a battle cruiser, she initially could get up to 32 and a half knots when launched. So she would be commissioned in March of 1927 and undergo training and trials until November of 1927, at which time she was officially welcomed into the Japanese Navy, becoming their second carrier, their first being 
Hosho, Hosho here, which is very much a first generation aircraft carrier. Funnily enough, Hosho would survive World War II and even have a brief post war career. Akagi would be their first big carrier. And then in 1928, she would be joined by Kaga. Kaga actually was laid down before Akagi, but because she was a last-minute substitution when Amagi was damaged, it took longer to convert her over. And in her first year of operation, Akagi was mostly used for training and experimenting with this newfangled aircraft carrier thing. And of course, she was uh, flying biplanes. This triple deck arrangement is quite interesting. They would have a few small naval guns. The uh, top deck here is 600 and 24 feet long, 100 feet wide. Not the biggest, but not bad. The front deck, though, which was designed for taking off, was only 108 feet long. And if that's that short enough, the middle deck was less than 50 feet long. Now, one neat thing about these front decks, you could take off from the hangar. And they had to two main hangers with a third hanger as kind of an auxiliary. Now, Kaga here could have 72 active aircraft and, and 18 in reserve, whereas Akagi was more like 66 with 24 in reserve. So they both had 90 planes, but a little bit different. And of course, this would change over time. The reason they could originally get away with these short flight decks were the biplanes that they were light and had a low takeoff and landing speed. But of course, by World War II, with new metal mono wings, this would this would very much change. But they were they were learning, and this shows you that Japan was one of the early advocates and saw the advantage in uh, carrier warfare, which is why coming into the World War II period, you, it's pretty much Japan the U.S. and Britain, who have anything like a carrier force. We won't consider Bern from France. Akagi, looking very much like Kaga here, at the end of 1928, got a new captain, probably no one you've ever heard of, Isaruku Yamamoto, <laughs> who would uh, captain her until November of 1929, so a full tour. Of course, he would go on to be uh, gr their version of Grand Admiral Thrawn of the fleet. <laughs> and so, yeah, she would continue maneuvers and, and whatnot. And then towards the end of 1931, she would put in, she would be in reserve for a minor refit. They would give her a new, more modern arrestor system for the airplanes. They would also work on her ventilation and, and funneling. Funnily enough, with that, uh, Kaga and Akagi would try a couple of different systems to work with uh, stacks because they really didn't know what to do with the stacks with the carriers at the time and they found out the Akagi version just worked better. And these did not have islands as such at the time either as you might notice. Instead they controlled operations kind of from uh, below decks arrangement here. Where are we at? Towards the front. So yeah, she was in for a minor refit, and uh, would be out by 1933. You go back to fleet maneuvers. Then, of course, in 1934, 1935, we have the, the Fourth Fleet incident and all that stuff. Kind of based on that and some other tech, she would then go in for this big refit here. They would essentially get away from the three flight deck arrangement as well as removing the guns, installing a big over 817 foot deck 
They would also install an island on Akagi on the port side, not the starboard. So like with Hiryu, kind of a neat decision for a carrier, but there it is. And of course the number of aircraft these could carry would change depending on the aircraft at the time because this is right when the A5M Claude was coming online. Now, Kaga would go on for refit and be done quite quickly, and her top speed would actually improve thanks to new systems. Akagi, on the other hand, would see a decrease in her top speed to that 31.5 knots because of extra stuff out of this big thing and because she was already designed for speed as a battle cruiser, so she didn't have new stuff installed. She'd also see things like her radio and other equipment updated. She would also go from having two elevators on board to three. But her conversion would take much longer even though it was a simpler task because uh, the Navy was kind of suffering from budgetary limits frankly because they were building so many ships and doing so much in this period. So while her conversion would begin in 1935, it would not be over until well into 1938. And with that, one of her first assignments after refit would be in January 1939 to support operations in China. After operating there, she would return home to port and then go back a little over a year later in 1940. And then after that, she would return back for a minor refit and update, and also to make some changes to things they noticed during her operational time. You know, kind of a shakedown cruise, changing this, updating that, removing that if it didn't work. You know, just kind of streamlining the design. Also keep in mind, by 1940, she's over a decade old. So sometimes it's just general wear and tear. And her crew would fluctuate all this time between, you know, 16, 1700, not counting the, uh, the pilots, the air crew. Then, in April of 1941, the Japanese Navy would consolidate all their fleet carriers into one major battle group, the first carrier group. Both Kaga and Akagi would be assigned to it. And, on April 10... Akagi would be made the flagship of said group, a position she would hold for over a year. So she started kind of training for her new assignment. And then in September, she started training for a little known operation to go pay a visit to the American base at Pearl Harbor. So her pilots would actually transfer to shore to practice especially with the new ordinance to work for the shallow bottoms there they would actually have kind of custom made bombs which were modified uh, cannon shells and they would have torpedoes designed to run shallow they would train with these get get used to them And then on November 22nd, she would meet up with the rest of the fleet. And between the 25th and 26th, they would take off for Pearl Harbor. And the reason that it took them so long to get there, they took a very winding, circuitous route to kind of throw off any observation and also to try to avoid any notice by military or commercial traffic to try to make it as much of a sneak attack as, as they could. And of course, on December 7, early in the morning that Sunday, the attack would begin and America would enter the war. And Japan would make a very unwise decision. Let's compare the two models before we go forward. As I said in the beginning, the KB Eagle Moss type here is uh, uh, one 1100 scale, and the D'Agostini is the more common 
one at 1250 scale. Price-wise, they're quite similar. The Eagle Moss KBs do cost a bit more, 30 to 40 dollars, whereas the D'Agostinis are in the 20 to 25 dollar range. And I don't feel that the, that the D'Agostinis are uh, a bad deal. They're quite good, but they're hard to find. At least the Akagi is hard to find in America, because I believe only one vendor really bought them in numbers. That would be uh, 1250ships.com. He seemed to have bought out the uh, the order for Akagis. But then again, the Eagle Moss ones are not easily found either because it was early in the collection and they're just popular and uncommon. So they have pretty similar lines. But the D'Agostini has pretty bare flight deck. The Eagle Moss has uh, aircraft on the deck. And what I like about the Eagle Moss type or the KB type, this here, the wooden deck, actually has texturing, like planking. It's not just uh, kind of a painted on or a sticker. Like here. It actually has something to feel. And it has a little more detailing like with the barriers here. The uh, island is a little more detailed. A little more detailing under the uh, deck. Where the hangar would be. And that's what I was saying on the, a lot of these videos. You wouldn't think going from 1100 to 1200 or 1250, they may both guess, would matter a whole lot. That doesn't seem like a uh, huge difference in size. It's really not, but it seems like it's just enough bigger to let that extra bit of detail, for example, things like the aircraft. It's just, it's just I don't know, it feels like a good scale. Maybe uh, 1000 would be even better. But uh, I like this 1100. I mean, this this thing is several inches long. I'm just, it feels very uh, sturdy. I know I'm impressed. And like I said, here's uh, Kaga and Hosho one more time. Hosho's so neat, little aircraft carrier. This is in its 1944 guise, so it's much with the modern aircraft. But you can still st tell the old style funnel arrangement. And of course, Kaga would look very different in 1941 from this. Pretty much like Akagi, but a little bit shorter and a little bit wider. But by 1941, they were getting pretty close in terms of speed, other performance, and even aircraft carried. They were both hovering in the uh with the newer airplanes they were able to have about 85 on board take a small downturn just because of the of the newer ones which are a little bit larger so her six months give or take service in world war ii and they were far from uneventful so she would lead the tack that morning her first wave would be with the B-5N Cates. They would uh, they would go after the USS Oklahoma, the West Virginia, and the California. Her second wave would be with the D-3As, the Vows, and they would target the Pennsylvania and the Maryland. And not to be outdone, zero fighters from. Akagi would strafe airfields and otherwise just be a nuisance, and they would attack a few other ships along the way. And she would only lose one or two airplanes. Uh, her planes would even be responsible for forcing a uh, B-17 down in flames. To the Japanese, a success, and she would go on 
in January to support the invasion of Rabaul. And from there, she would go in March to help support the invasion of Java and then into the Indian Ocean raids at the end of the month. And this was basically to take on and neutralize the British Eastern Fleet. To that end, Akagi would be there during their raid on Colombo. Oh, I forgot to mention, I apologize. In uh, February, she would take part in the uh, raid on Darwin, a pretty important event in Australian history. And she would help sink multiple ships. Anywho, she would uh, be there during the raid on Colombo. And after that, she would take part in the sinking of another carrier, HMS Hermes. And after that, she would narrowly miss being bombed by rather outraged Bristol Blenheims, but receiving only superficial damage and no direct hits. Nevertheless, at the end of April, after being in constant use for five months in combat, just sailing around, her supplies were low, pilots and crew tired, and she was in need of a minor overhaul, so she would put into port for that, which is why she missed the uh, Battle of the Coral Sea. But she was ready for action again. And on May 25th, she would leave to take part in what her former captain, now Admiral Yamamoto, hoped would be a decisive victory at a little-known speck of land in the ocean, Midway. He had originally hoped to have all six of his fleet carriers, but he could only muster four for reasons not to go into in this video. But he thought that would be enough because America was not in the best positions, even though her carriers had mostly escaped unharmed at Pearl Harbor. Lexington was lost. Yorktown was badly damaged. So he thought he had a pretty good chance, and of course he did not know that the Japanese naval code had been broken and that the Americans knew he was coming at Midway. However, I don't know, even if the Japanese knew this, if they would have stopped their attack because, frankly, half a year of victory after victory had made them drunk with power. But Midway would quickly disabuse them of this notion. Although, it wasn't... The absolute immediate success in June 1942 that you might think. It wouldn't be until a few months later that the real gravity of the situation would hit Japan. So on June 4th, Akagi, Kaga, Soryu, and Hiryu launched what they thought was a surprise attack on Midway. Even though the Americans knew they were coming, Honestly, for the first couple of hours, things still went Japan's way. And I don't feel like recounting the Battle of Midway right here, right now. I've done that in other videos. And I will do kind of a overall video with the carriers plus the Americans. So let's just say things went all their way until the SBDs showed up. In the first flight of those we had 28 and for some reason they all decided to target Kaga. That was around 1020 that morning. So Akagi nearly got off but at the last minute three of the dive bomber pilots kind of saw what was happening and broke off and went for Akagi. Now three typically wouldn't be so bad except they all kind of got lucky. Two of the three bombs were near misses, and near misses can be quite devastating. It did, one of the near misses at least, damaged the rudder, and did damage to some secondary things, pumps, machinery, kind of gear, from the impacts, splinters, and what have you. 
But it was a third bomb, and it was a big one. It was a thousand pounder, and it hit pretty square right here on the flight deck. Punched through, went into the hangar, and exploded. And as you know, the planes were kind of scattered about. There were fuel lines. There was uh, ordnance, bombs, torpedoes everywhere. There's a lot of fodder. So that was not good. Now the captain ordered that the uh, the ordnance magazines all they be flooded, and the front magazine was. So that was pretty good insurance, except for, you know keeping it from exploding. However, that near miss, it screwed up all the pumps, and they were not able to flood the rear magazine, meaning that it was just a firecracker waiting to go off, and. Akagi was uh, burning rather uncontrollably. So she was knocked out of the action, as were two of her sister carriers, in well under 10 minutes. Actually, by noon, they only had Hiryu left. Now, Akagi was still afloat, but... Her, her damage control teams were, were losing the battle, frankly. So the captain gave the order to abandon ship. And luckily, because I don't like seeing slaughter, and you don't either, over a 1,000 of the crew were able to be rescued. I mean, over 600 died, which is, you know, it's war. But in World War II, you'll read accounts of ships being sunk where all hands were lost. So considering that... With over half the crew escaping, it could have been worse. Could have been much worse. Like I said, her kind of fellow older ship, Kaga, would have the exact same fate as her with being hit by over, well, being targeted by two dozen dive bombers and hit by a lot of bombs. <laughs> Finally enough of these two big ships, Hosho here, who was at, you know, who was around, but in a secondary, kind of second line support role, would uh, return from Midway and other battles, and would serve to the end of the war, and then even after the war briefly. She was a whole other kettle of fish. So, yeah, I just thought I would do this video. Revisiting Akagi and sharing this new, kind of somewhat new brand, KB. It really is just Eagle Moss, at least the factory that did them. But you see that a lot. Look how many companies have used the uh, IXO tooling. De Agostini, Atlas Editions, Warmaster, Salido. That's kind of how the model world works. And I do like how they did the stand. Now, I will say this. It would be hard if you had 80, if all the Eagle Moss, for example, were this size. It would be very hard to uh, have shelf space for something this big. But for kind of centerpiece collections, like this, or Yamato, or an Essex carrier, it really brings attention. So if you wanted to do a fleet setup with like the flagships, this sets it apart. Now, I do really like the uh, plexiglass uh, top. I wish all models came with something like this. Keeps the dust off, keeps the pets away, and just keeps them from getting knocked over and accidentally damaged. That's a great idea. So, yeah, I'm going to be seeing what else might come out from this brand, and maybe if it, we'll even see some things that Eagle Moss didn't do. It's possible. Alrighty guys, with that, I appreciate you tuning in. As always, if you could, like, share, and subscribe. And if you have any comments, please do post them below. This is Misha. Catch you very soon. Next time.